And then the final announcement is, don't forget, there's three ways to support this ministry financially. Number one, you can use what we call the Yay God boxes. Little black boxes in the lobby as you come or as you go, they say Yay God box on them. You can just drop your offering in there. We don't pass a plate. We don't pressure anybody to give. If you do decide to support this ministry financially, we really appreciate your support. We depend on it. And you just give whatever the Lord puts on your heart to give. And we'll, we'll be grateful. And then you can also use the QR code that you see on the screen or the URL. It's also on the program that you were handed this morning. You can give securely online or you can send a check to the PO box. All three easy ways to make sure we're able to continue to do everything God's called us to do. So mahalo for your support. Well, we're still talking about some of the Old Testament names for God the Father. Uh, that we see in Hebrew, and we're trying to help us accomplish our daily goal, which is to learn to know God a little bit better and to learn to love God a little bit more. I've said before that if at the end of the day, no matter what else you have or have not accomplished, if you can lay your head down on your bed at night and say, you know what, I love God a little bit more today than I did yesterday, and I know God a little bit better today than I did yesterday, then that day is a successful day. You can count that day as a success, no matter what else you did or did not accomplish. On the converse side of that, if you have actually done all kinds of amazing business deals and you've just really had a fantastic, successful day by worldly standards, but at the end of the day, if you lay down and you can't say, I know God a little bit better and I love God a little bit more than I did yesterday, then whatever else you accomplish that day, it's not going to last. That's a, that's a failure day. You need to make sure you love God a little bit more and know God a little bit better every single day. So that's part of why we're doing this, learning these Hebrew names of God. We're learning what they mean as well as their historical context where they first appear in the Scriptures. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what each of these names mean to us personally in our lives as well. So, so far in this series, we've covered El, We've covered Elohim, El Elyon, El Olan, Adonai, El Shaddai, Yahweh, Jehovah. And today we're going to look at two of the compound Jehovah names. Now, I shared last week that the name Jehovah is actually an unfortunate misspelling error, a spelling error of the personal Hebrew name of God, which is Yahweh. And this error occurred back in the 12th century. There was a translating monk who... Uh, many scholars believe what he did was he, he kind of put the vowels of the name Adonai together with the consonants of the name Yahweh, and he incorrectly came up with this name Jehovah. And then it ended up in William Tyndall's study Bible, who said in the footnotes, God's name is Jehovah, and it just kind of stuck. And so thousands of books, thousands of articles, a whole, uh, you know, religious movement next door has been based on this name uh, Jehovah. But really, we're going to stick with this Jehovah misspelling because we want to stay consistent with what you've heard your whole life, I'm sure. But I just want to say these names really should be written as Yahweh, not Jehovah. Yahweh is the name of God. So let's talk about Jehovah Nisi or Yahweh Nisi first. Now, in Hebrew, this word Nisi refers to a flag or a banner or a standard. And in battle terms, a standard is an insignia, usually wooden or metal, that an army carries before them on a pole as they march into battle, just like we sang Onward Christian Soldiers this morning. Uh, flags and other cloth banners can be used in this way as well. Now, nasas, which is the verb form of this Hebrew word nisi, nasas means to be visible. That's what the verb means, to be conspicuous, to be obvious, to raise a standard, to raise a flag, to raise a beacon, to say, yo, here I am over here, right? It's being conspicuous. It's not just for decorative or even patriotic purposes. The Nisi, the standard, served as a focal point of courage and victory for the army. And we understand this idea when we look at American history, you know, we sing our national anthem, Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Play ball, right? And so as long as our standard, our banner is raised, as long as our flag still flies, we say, oh, we have confidence that we can win the battle. And what happens is when the enemy captures our headquarters, they'll immediately lower our banner and they'll raise their own banner. And that's when everybody on the battlefield knows the battle has been lost for us. That's when the enemy knows the battle has been won 
for them. So this name of God, Jehovah Nisi, technically Yahweh Nisi, means the Lord our banner. Or it can be translated from God's point of view, meaning I am the Lord your banner. So where does this name first appear in Scripture? I want to give you a little bit of background, and then we'll look at the circumstances that bring this particular name of God, Jehovah Nisi, to the forefront. Now, we spoke earlier in this series about the patriarchs of the Jewish faith, right? We talked about uh, Abraham, who had two sons. One son was named Ishmael, the other was named Isaac, and then Isaac had two sons as well. They were fraternal twins named Jacob and Esau, and Esau was the firstborn, but he foolishly sold his birthright to his brother Jacob just because he was really hungry one day and he wanted some stew. And then Jacob is later renamed Israel by God. Israel, or Jacob, has 12 sons. From them, we get the 12 tribes of Israel, which eventually grew into the nation of Israel. And then they and their descendants, they start out in the good graces of the nation of Egypt, but then they're later forced into slavery by an Egyptian pharaoh that comes along later. Eventually, Moses comes along. He eventually leads them out of slavery to the promised land. Okay, So that's that sort of history that we've talked about. Now Esau, we mentioned Esau a few minutes ago. He had several sons also, and one of his grandsons was a guy named Amalek. So we put this family tree together, and we see that Amalek, grandson of Esau, was a second cousin to the sons of Israel. Now, remember, Jacob had stolen the birthright that rightly belonged to Esau. He kind of tricked him out of it. And I'd guess that Esau's children and grandchildren were probably still a bit bent, 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 a bit bent out of shape about this. So the story probably got told with some grumbling around the family dinner tables about how that rotten Jacob had tricked granddad Esau out of his birthright. And over time, this grumbling grew into hatred and grew into thoughts of revenge. And if Esau and his descendants had continued to follow Yahweh, like Abraham, Isaac, Israel, and the 12 sons of Israel did, they too would have had a place in the promised land, but they didn't. And so it's not surprising that the Amalekites, the descendants of Amalek, eventually show up to make war with the Israelites. And it started off as raiding parties, but it escalated quickly into a full-blown military conflict. Now, as we all know, attacking God's chosen ones always draws God's wrath. And so Moses ordered his army, led by Joshua, to gather the Israelite army and to go out and attack Amalek and his army. Let's read the account of what happened in Exodus 17. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, whenever he got tired and lowered his hands, the Amalekites started to win. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that Moses' hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar, and he called it, The Lord is my banner, or Yahweh Nisi, or Jehovah Nisi. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So Moses holds up the staff of God as a type of banner for his troops to focus on and to take courage from. As long as the banner's still flying, we're still winning, right? And if we read the rest of the Exodus story, we see that God gave this wooden staff to Moses to use as a focal point for performing many miracles in the course of freeing the Israelites from slavery. And this wooden staff raised high above Moses' head, it becomes the first Nisi, the first flag, the first standard, the first banner 
of the Israelites. And again, when the Nisi, when the banner was raised above Moses' head, high on a hill above them, they were winning. When the Nisi, when their flag, when their standard, when their banner was lowered, they began to lose. And this flag, this staff, this Nisi was actually a visible reminder to them that they were 100% dependent upon God to win this battle for them. They were participants in the battle, but it was Yahweh Nisi who would ultimately provide them with victory. So I want us to take away two big ideas from this story. The big idea number one is, again, it was God who won this battle. It was God who won the battle. It was not Joshua. It was not Moses. It was not Aaron. It was not Hur. It was not the fighting men of Israel. They all faithfully did what God commanded them to do, but it was Jehovah Nisi. It was Yahweh Nisi that actually won the battle for them. The Lord my banner can also be translated or understood as the Lord my defender. The Lord my defender. So the Israelites won, not because the Israelites were necessarily stronger or braver or better trained or better equipped. In fact, there were many times during the day early on that they were losing the battle because Moses' hands came down and they lost faith. They lost confidence. There was nothing magical about Moses' staff. There was nothing magical about Moses' abilities. He wasn't sending power down to the fighting men. There wasn't any power within Moses himself when he lifted his arms that caused them to win. But Moses' uplifted arms were a symbol of what was really taking place in the spirit realm by God's power. And it was only when Moses lifted his arms, which is a universal sign of surrender and humility, a sign of giving God complete control, complete glory, that God acted and the Israelites were victorious. And if Moses had forgotten about God, if he had lowered his arms, if he trusted in his own leadership abilities, if he trusted in Joshua's fighting and leadership abilities, if he trusted only in the army's fighting abilities, they would have lost this battle. And so the same thing went for the fighting men of Israel. When they looked up on the hill and they saw the staff of God, which was their banner, their flag, their standard, their, their Nisi, when they saw it still raised, they knew that God was still in charge, God was still in control. They focused their dependence upon the power of God. And when this, this Nisi, when this staff wasn't visible, that's when they would tend to trust in their own abilities, and that's when they would begin to lose. So what can we take away from this? I wonder... Do you ever feel like you're fighting any battles in your life? Is there anybody who would not say that's true? Do you ever feel like you're fighting some battles in your life? And maybe your battle is not physical life and death where an army is trying to kill you like this example, but we all have battles going on in our life. Maybe you're fighting the battle of the bulge like me. Maybe you're fighting a battle against debt. Maybe you're fighting a battle against depression or against cancer. Or maybe you're fighting a battle against some injury, or you're fighting a battle against some difficult to overcome sin. And so are you facing a battle right now that you feel like, I'm not sure I can win this battle. I think I'm going to lose this battle. Is it a battle against people? Is it a battle against an organization or a system? Is it a battle against temptation? Is it a battle against regrets or painful memories? And if we're all honest this morning, I think we would all say yes to at least one of those questions. Yeah, we're all certainly fighting some battle in the grand spiritual battle between good and evil, light and dark. Now, the Apostle Paul describes the life of a Christ follower this way. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're all fighting battles in this life. We all certainly uh, are a part of the spiritual battle that Paul's describing. And even if everything else in life right now might feel like it's moving along pretty smoothly. Sometimes people say, oh man, I had a buddy named uh, Mr. Ralph Wiggins years ago in North Carolina. And every time he'd ask Mr. Ralph how he's doing, I'd say, how you doing today, Mr. Ralph? He'd say, oh, Greg, if I was doing any better, I'd be twins. If I was doing any better, I couldn't stand myself. He just was always having a good day. And I know that wasn't true. There was stuff going on behind the scenes, but he always had to kind of put forth that super positive exterior. But if we really admit it to ourselves and to others, we're all fighting a battle of some kind. 
even if everything else in life seems to be rolling along pretty smooth. And if we insist on relying only on our own strength, only on our own wisdom, only on our own ingenuity, only on our own abilities, we're guaranteed to lose the really big, really important battles in life. So the wooden staff of God, the banner of God that Moses raises high on a hill, it also foreshadows for us the wooden cross of Jesus Christ raised high on a hill. Like Moses, Jesus carried his banner of the wooden cross up a hill and he raised it high as a symbol of God's victory over our spiritual enemies of sin and Satan. And the outstretched, lifted high arms of Jesus Christ on the cross signal to us that we too will win the battle. Jehovah Nisi, Yahweh Nisi, Yeshua Nisi is the Lord our banner. And like Moses, we need to continue to raise high the banner of Christ. Or as the author of Hebrews uh, puts it, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So the Lord, our banner, the Lord, our defender, is the all-powerful God who can influence what happens in this world. He will be the ultimate victor in every battle that he fights. And by the way, I've read the last page of the book, and God wins. So we can have some good thoughts about that. We can say, hey, you know what? Even though I know I'm under attack, I also know God is always ready to help me. And I also know that God wins in the end. So when we feel like we're under attack, know that God is doing the fighting for us. If we stay open to Him, if we rely on Him, if we raise our hands in complete surrender and humility to Him and say, not my will be done, but your will be done, onward, Christian soldiers, right? And so big idea number two, never underestimate the power of effective encouragement of friends. Never underestimate the power of the effective encouragement of friends. It's clear that Moses' mind and Moses' spirit were willing, but he was an old dude and his body was weak. I'm sure he wanted to keep his arms raised for hours and hours in submission, giving glory to God. But after those several hours, he, he just couldn't do it. Moses was over 80 years old when this adventure began, and they've been on a pretty long journey already when this battle of the Amalekites goes down. And so life can be really exhausting, even under the best of circumstances. You know that as well as I do. So that's what happens to Moses too. He just runs out of energy physically. He can't get the job done. But fortunately, he's not alone. He has some good friends nearby who are just as committed to the vision as he is. And so they step in to hold up his arms when he gets tired. And you and I, we need some friends like that around us in those situations too. Because we all get weary sometimes. It's just a fact of life. There's going to be a day when you're the weary one. There's going to be a day when I'm the weary one. And the secret is to not all be weary at the same time, but to be able to take turns kind of being the strong one. And when you're having a rough day, I pick up the slack. And when I'm having a rough day, you pick up the slack and we cross the finish line together. When we trust our Jehovah Nisi, our Yahweh Nisi, to bring the ultimate victory when the time is right, it's also true that doing battle together, doing life together, lifting each other up when necessary, that's vital to our Christian life success as well. Our job is to keep trusting God and to keep persevering together as the body of Christ in the meantime. God says, I am your Lord. I am your banner. I am your standard. I am your defender. I am your victory. Trust in me. The other name we want to talk about today is Jehovah Rapha or Yahweh Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. Or speaking this name from God's point of view, God says, I am the Lord, your healer. Now, this name shows up first in Exodus as well. It's right after the parting of the Red Sea, again accomplished by the raising banner of Moses' staff, this symbol that God is doing the actual miracle of the parting of the waters. The Israelites travel through safely to the other side, and then God destroys the enemy Egyptian army that's been pursuing them. You know that story? It's all Ten Commandments, right? And then soon after this, this happens. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. 
For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. Excuse me, bitter. That's why the place is called Mara, a word that means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses and said, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And he threw this piece of wood into the water, and the water became fit to drink. And there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Rapha, or I am Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals you. Now, this Hebrew word Rapha is used about 60 times in the Old Testament, and it means to restore or to heal or to cure. In 1 Kings 18.30, we get another picture of what Rapha means when we read that Elijah repaired the altar of Jehovah. It's Rapha, it's the same word that's used. In 2 Kings 2.21, God heals or he Rapha the water when Elisha throws salt into a sour spring. So this word Rapha carries with it the idea of not just healing, but restoring something to its best condition, returning something to its purest, strongest, most original state. And so we read that Moses led the people of Israel into the desert of Shur. Now that word Shur in Hebrew means wall. The desert of Shur is the desert of the wall. And I think they named it that way partially because the Israelites hit a wall. They hit a wall physically, they hit a wall spiritually, they hit a wall emotionally. And you and I, we can relate to that feeling too, can't we? Have you ever felt like, man, I have hit a wall. I've just hit a wall. Maybe you're there right now. You feel like, man, Greg, I'll be honest with you. I have hit a wall, right? That's where the Israelites were. They were almost run down, slaughtered by the Egyptian army. In the nick of time, God split the Red Sea and saved them as they ran for their lives across the dry seabed. That challenge ended well for them, but still it was incredibly stressful and incredibly exhausting. It was a major victory. They sang God's praises. They celebrated the victory. We love it when we have those victory moments as well too, don't we? We love the celebration times. We wish we could stay on that mountaintop of celebration forever, but just like it does for us, the journey began again for the Israelite. You can't stop on that one victory. Life goes on. And so they walked on through the desert for three days with no water, and they couldn't find water anywhere. And what happens in that, in that situation is all of the memories, all of the euphoria, all of the gratefulness of the recent victory are now gone from their minds. In fact, they're completely forgotten. And they totally doubt God again. And they grumble again, and they complain again. And instead of focusing on what they did have, and instead of focusing on where God had already been incredibly faithful to them, they were again obsessed with what they did not have. Hello, somebody. And when they finally did find a spring, the water wasn't fit to drink. It was diseased or sour or something, full of something bad. We don't know for sure exactly what was wrong with it, but it wasn't safe to drink and it tasted very bitter. And so you can just kind of feel the fear and the disappointment and the discouragement in their voices in that time, right? As they hit the wall, as they gave it everything they got, and yet nothing worked out for us. Everything's falling apart. Nothing's going the way I want it to go. You can relate to that. You felt that way. And they say, oh, great. This is just perfect. Perfect. First, we can't find any water. And then when we finally do find water, it's poison water. That's just great. Thanks a lot, God. Thanks a lot, Moses. This is just perfect. Now we're going to die of thirst out here. Wonderful. They'd hit the wall. They'd hit the wall in the desert of Shur. Have you ever heard somebody who's incredibly frustrated speak like that or have words like that ever come out of your mouth when you felt incredibly frustrated by a situation? in life. So what does Moses do? Moses does what he should do, 
what they all should have done and what all of us should always do in those situations. Instead of protesting, instead of whining and griping and moaning and grumbling and complaining against God, Moses just prays. He just immediately takes the concerns to God and talks to Him about it. And I have found, even when the biggest doubters, often even when the most staunch atheists, when they come to these incredibly troubled times of life, when they find themselves in their own personal desert of sure, facing the wall, often they will risk saying a little prayer to God, just in case, even if they're an atheist, just in case, against the odds that God is actually real and God actually does exist, and maybe He does here, and maybe He will help, and so I'll just, I'll just float a little prayer out there just in case. Maybe it's still a prayer full of doubt, Maybe it's still a prayer full of low expectations, but there's something in every single human being in our most troubling times that leads us to cry out for help. And we cry out to God, as Moses did, to hope for an answer, to hope for a miracle, to hope for a solution, to hope for healing. And God answers Moses. And He does something kind of unusual. He just shows him a piece of wood. He says, pick up that wood and throw it into the water. That seems kind of weird, right? I mean, logically, why would we come up with that as a solution? Oh, I found poison water. I think I'll toss this two by four into it and see if that fixes everything, right? That's probably going to solve it. Poison water, throw in some wood, everything's healed. Seems weird. Moses doesn't question it. He just trusts God, and he does what God tells him to do, and God heals the water. It's not the wood that he threw in that healed the water. It was Moses' faithfulness of doing what God told him to do and trusting God to take care of the problem. And God took care of the problem. He healed the water. And in doing so, he heals his thirsty people. And in the midst of their bitterness and hurt, God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, their healer. And again, what healed the water? It wasn't the wood. It was the power of God. And just like Moses lifting a piece of wood in his arms isn't what brought the victory against the Amalekites, Moses chucking that piece of wood into the water isn't what made it clean. And just as the power of God was what won the battle against the Amalekites, it was the power of God that healed the water and saved the Israelites once again. Just as it was Moses' humility and surrender and obedience to trust God and let God be God in their lives that led to this miracle of their victory against the Amalekites, it's also Moses' trust and humility and surrender and obedience here in the desert of Shur as they've hit the wall that is the vehicle of God's healing power being made manifest in their life. And God uses this as a teaching moment to reveal another of His names, another aspect of His power and character. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am Yahweh Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. And so this wood, Moses tosses into the bitter waters, and the waters are made pure, they're made clean, and provide life to all who drink from the spring. And again, we see additional foreshadowing of what Jesus would come to do. Not just for one nation of people, but for all nations of people. And not just for one isolated incident in one desert for all times and all places. The wooden cross of Christ is effectively thrown into the bitterness of sin and brings about the sweet taste of forgiveness to all who drink from His saving act in faith. Right? And so the prophet Isaiah, speaking of the future Messiah Jesus, says this, Surely He took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered Him punished by God, stricken by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Him, and by His wounds we are Rapha in Hebrew. We are healed. And this living water in the desert of Shur, it also points us to the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus told us, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So here in the desert of Shur, the work of the Father, the work of the Son on the wooden cross, and the work of the Holy Spirit, who is the living water, all come together as Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord, the Trinity God, who heals us. Now, 
I know many of you have suffered a major injury. Many of you have suffered a major illness or a major emotional trauma at some point in your life. And some of you are going through that right now. Maybe you've taken a hard fall or you've been in a terrible accident. Maybe you lost a loved one to death. Maybe your marriage was lost to divorce, no matter how hard you tried to save it. Maybe some other tragic end to a relationship that meant the world to you has happened to you. All of us have experienced some kind of pain, some kind of loss, the bitter realities of the fallen world that we live in. And when we find ourselves hurting in these various many different kinds of ways, it occurs to me that whatever that ailment is, we are often in need of three types of healing. Number one, physical healing. Number two, emotional healing. And number three, spiritual healing. So maybe some of you are dealing with a physical frailty right now. Maybe you are exhausted emotionally. You're just completely stressed out to the max, you have hit the wall. Maybe some of your past hurts are still causing you present pain, either physically or emotionally. And there's a good chance that you've slipped spiritually at some way, at some point in your life that still causes some bitterness or regret as well. I love Psalm 6 verses 2 through 3 because in just two verses, David gives us a glimpse into the reality of these three types of healing needs. And often it's tough to separate our physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. They all just kind of run together and each affects the other two. And we can't really tell where one begins and the other ends. And David talks about this. He says, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? First, David says, he's faint. That's emotional pain he's talking about. He's stressed out to the max. He says, I can't take it anymore. I have hit my own personal desert of the wall. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to curl up in a ball and just lose it. And some of you have been there emotionally before. Maybe That's where you are right now, overwhelmed with life. Second, David says his bones are in agony. That's a great description of physical pain, isn't it? Some of you have that kind of physical pain in your body. Arthritis pain, joint pain, back pain, muscle pain, nerve pain, phantom pain. Can you relate to that? David says, I'm not just a little sore. I'm not just a little achy. He's saying, my bones are in agony. These two words translated agony and anguish in Hebrew, they're the same word. It's the word bahal. David says, my bones are bahal and my mind is bahal and my soul is bahal. My physical, emotional, and spiritual self is in agony. It's in anguish. And this word Bahal, it can also be translated to be disturbed, to be alarmed, to be anxious, to be worried, to be terrified, to be nervous, to be dismayed, to lose your courage, to lose your resolve, to give up. And that's the condition David is in as he writes this song of prayer to God. David says, I have hit the wall. I'm in tremendous need of physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. So in verse 4, he sends up this prayer, which I think was probably very similar to Moses' prayer in the desert of Shur. David says, turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. And David talks about soaking his bed and his couch with his tears. He talks about being overwhelmed with depression and sorrow. And throughout this phase of his life, it's clear that he just continually, continually, continually prays. He's constantly crying out to God. And then we get to verses 8 and 9. He says, Away from me, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard 
my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. God shows himself to David as Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha. I am the Lord your God who heals you. And you know, God will reveal himself to you in that same way as well if you let him. And we need to remember, sometimes God's timetable for our healing is different than our timetable that we have in mind. Because we always want instantaneous healing. That's what we always want, always. But sometimes there's a bigger lesson involved. There's a bigger plan involved at work through our pain. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think that's right on target. When everything in life is going great, perfect, wonderful, I sometimes take my eyes off of my banner, Yahweh, Nisi, and I begin to trust in myself. I think I'm the master of my own fate. I think my success is due to something I've done, right? But when life is tough, when life is hard, when life is clearly beyond my abilities, my wisdom, my energy, when I begin to feel faint, when I feel agony in my bones, when I feel anguish in my spirit, that's when I'm ready to listen for God's voice. And I hear God's voice loud and clear. That's when I'm ready to connect again with Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh Rapha, the Lord, my defender and my healer. And of course, sometimes God's healing also takes place in unusual ways, in ways that we don't anticipate or expect. God's healing comes in ways we don't immediately understand or appreciate. And sometimes God's healing doesn't come in the way that we've prayed for it to happen at all. But God's healing always eventually comes. Sociologist, professor, and author Tony Campolo tells a story about uh, being in a church speaking one day, and he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. And so he prayed boldly for this man's healing. They laid hands on him, and they anointed him with oil, and they prayed, and they prayed. And then the next week, he got a telephone call from the man's wife. And she said, you remember me? You prayed for my husband. He had cancer. And at first, Campalo thought when he heard her use the past tense, he had cancer, that the cancer had been eradicated. He thought the man had been cured. He said, yeah, I remember. And she said, well, he died. And Campalo said he felt terrible. And she said, don't feel bad. When you saw him, he was so filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short period of time. And he was so bitter, he hated God because of that. He felt cheated out of life. He was 58 years old, and he wanted to see his children and his grandchildren grow up, and he knew that wasn't going to happen. And he was angry that this all-powerful God did not immediately take away his sickness and heal him. And so he would lie in bed, and he would curse God. And the more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everybody else around him. It was an awful thing to be in his presence. But then the lady told Kampalo, she said, after you prayed for him, a peace came over him and a joy entered into him. And Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our marriage. We have sung, we have laughed, we've read the scriptures together, we've prayed. Oh, they've been wonderful days. And so I just wanted to call you and thank you for laying your hands on him and for praying for healing. And then she said something very profound. She said, Tony, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. He wasn't cured, but he was healed. When we trust in, when we cry out to Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, the healing may not necessarily come the way we expect or ask, in the timing that we expect or ask. It may not even come on this side of eternity, but the healing will always come. And so as we close this morning, I want us to go back to Exodus for a moment. After God made the sour waters of Marah sweet in the desert of Shur, 
What he did next was he led the Israelites to a place called Elam. Elam had 12 springs of beautiful, fresh, delicious, clear water and 70 palm trees. We've talked a lot about the significance of certain numbers in Hebrew writing. I want you to note that there's a spring for each of the 12 tribes. And I want you to note that there are 70 palms, seven times 10. Seven is a divine number, a perfect number, a complete number, a holy number. Ten is the human number. And so when they turned to, when they trusted in the Lord, their healer, at the bitter waters of Mara, God led them then to a place of plenty, to the sweet waters of Elam, designed specifically for them to drink and to rest under the shade of the trees, to be restored and to be healed and to be rejuvenated for the next leg of their journey together. And for us, the only way to go from Mara to Elam is to turn to our God, to come to the Father through Jesus the Son, who is Jehovah Rapha. He is Yahweh Rapha. He is Yeshua Rapha, the God who heals. I'm so glad to know Jesus as my Yeshua Rapha, the Lord, my healer. I hope you know him this way as well. Whether you're hurting emotionally today, hurting physically today, hurting spiritually today, or all of the above, I just want to urge you to turn everything over to Jehovah Rapha, Yahweh Rapha, Yeshua Rapha right now, and to trust in the Lord, your healer. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray for everyone here today who's hurting physically, spiritually, emotionally. I pray for those who have had a a chronic illness or a chronic injury, something they've been dealing with for years, maybe even for decades. I pray for them to reach out to you today and to receive whatever it is that you want to give to them whether it's perseverance, whether it's miraculous healing, whether it's incremental healing towards a bigger goal that we don't see. We just want to trust you for whatever that answer is, God. Of course, what we desire is miraculous healing, miraculous curing, instantaneous healing 100% of the way. That's what we always want. And we are free to ask for that. And God, we do ask for that. God, we ask for a miracle to be done in each of these people's lives. Whoever is wounded, whoever is hurting, whoever is injured, whoever is sick, heal them, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Bring a miraculous, instantaneous healing to their body, soul, mind, and spirit right now. That's our prayer. But our bigger prayer, God, is that we trust you for your will and your answers and your mindset and your timing and your methods and your type of healing and the way that you use our pain to help others, as we've talked about in the past, being wounded healers who show the world who you are by the fact that we can persevere through everything. We know what C.S. Lewis said, that you whisper to us in our pleasures, you speak to us in our conscience, you shout to us in our pains. God, we pray that in our pain right now, that would become a vehicle for hearing your word even better, knowing your way even better, following your will even closer. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself as Jehovah Rapha, and as Jehovah Nisi, our banner and our healer. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name. Amen.